at the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop, if it's on our shelves, it's history. You know, I was reading in your book, Gary, all the, uh, the Jews that he knew in Illinois, and how many of them were haberdashers? But you wouldn't know it by looking at the guy <laughs> that he knew one Jewish haberdasher. This is, you know, uh, so just wondering about that, but let's talk about some of the, uh, one in particular, first of all, uh, who was so large in the Lincoln story in Illinois, uh, Abraham Jonas. And Jonas is an interesting guy from Quincy. Uh, he was one of the closest to Lincoln. Uh, I don't know if he was any closer or who was closer. Uh, uh, is a car Zachary, his uh, chiropodist, or Jonas. But Jonas was interesting because he also had sons on both sides of this conflict. And he had two or three sons, I think, on the Confederate side. Uh, so I don't know if they had communication during the war, but tell us a little bit about Jonas and the influence he had on Lincoln. Well, I think their relationship really starts out uh, when they're both very young men. Uh, they uh, Evidently, we can only assume that they begin to become friends in uh, the late 1830s. Uh, that's when... Uh, Jonas comes to Quincy, Illinois, and somehow, probably in their lawyerly work, they meet one another, and they find that they have common political interests. Uh, they're both Whigs, and they're both uh, have aspirations, and it seems early on that they build this friendship, not just on uh, some of the friendships that we've seen with Lincoln uh, and the Jews, where he buys clothing and he shops. He these two men have a, a, a political bond and, and they become associated both as friends and as uh, fellow travelers in the political world. And this continues on. I mean, many people are unaware of the fact that one of the Lincoln-Douglas debates takes place in Quincy for the very reason that Jonas is there. And one of the interesting documents, I just want to uh, mention it, that I don't think anybody has in, encountered is it, it was a very hot not even published document, it was actually just written out by one of Jonas's sons, one of these many sons that he had, who talked later in life about being a little boy and remembering Lincoln coming to Quincy for the debate. And I reproduce that in the book because it's, it's so rare it isn't even published on its own practically. And he talks about how uh, Lincoln uh, sneaks up on him uh, he's he's a little boy, he's maybe 11 or 9 or whatever it is, he's a child, and Lincoln sneaks up on him and tickles him from behind with like a willow. And, uh, you know, he swats it away as if he's a fly, he remembers this. And then Link, he says he, he climbs into Lincoln's lap or he hugs Lincoln or whatever. Well, this in and of itself only adds evidence to the kind of bond that the family had. And as you were probably leading me, uh, Dan, uh, uh, what we know is that uh, poor Mr. Jonas after, I mean, there's a lot that goes on. I mean, the, the whole, uh, this, this whole concern about Lincoln being assassinated on his way into Washington, it, it, Jonas plays a key role in that. And, and One and of his sons. One of, right. In, 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 in it, right, it's tipped off from yeah. the Southerner. And then, of course, one of the most, uh, to me, uh, 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 really a remarkable, it's almost unbelievable phenomena is the, uh, the relating to Lincoln is that uh, Jonas becomes ill and, and is, is dying in, in, in 1864, I uh, believe it is, uh, and, uh, but during, during his presidency and, and Jonas... Uh, the family asks Lincoln to release the son who fought for the Confederacy, Charles is his name, and he asks that he be released from prison, allowed to go up to see his father before he dies. Lincoln complies with this request. That document has been preserved. We have it in Lincoln's handwriting. He asks that this man be released and allowed to go and see his father and then returned. And, uh, he makes it just prior to his death. That's unbelievable sign of friendship. And then he appoints his widow to carry on as mm -hmm. postmaster 
for Jonas in uh, Quincy, Illinois. And Jonas got one of the uh, few Lincoln Douglas debates extant signed. Right. And in fact, Lincoln was telling him he was going to get one even before he uh, obtained that hundred of them as well. Um, I was just curious, were the sons in the Confederacy, did, did they understand the closeness of their dad to the Union president? Yes, and it, you know, it's one of the uh, great enigmas of American Jewish history that just, you, you don't know how to explain how, how many examples there are, Dan, of Jewish families fighting on both sides of the conflict. It's, it's you wonder, how, how does that happen? Well, it was a port of call there. I mean, they, they were not only coming into the north, but they were coming in through Houston uh, at the same time, were they not? And yes. Staying in the south. Well, yes, and and, and it's it's true that the, the Jews, being immigrants, largely would identify with their local surroundings and want to, uh, you know, want to connect. But you wonder how is it that, I mean, literally there there are instances of brothers actually meeting on the battlefield, literally mm -hmm. brothers. Mm -hmm. uh, it, this is one of those enigmas you don't know how to explain. For example, how do you explain what was going on in the in the mind? of Southern Jews who are sitting around a Passover table in the South, celebrating their exodus from Egypt, and then calling their slaves to come in and serve the food. I mean, how, how what was on, uh, we don't, there's no answer to this. We don't have a document that tells us this. And there's no Lama involved that comes Right, this. right. But, and so the, the, the answer is that the Jonas family is not unusual. For whatever reason, he had these children, some were in the south, some were in the north. They definitely knew about their father's connection, but for whatever reason, it was the identification of the uh, son Charles with the south. He picks up arms and goes to, to war in the south. Well, you know, I mean, they, as I said, that whole area was a border state, right. and all the border states ripped apart, brother right. versus right. brother. Yeah. Gary, you were, you were going to ask me a question about Oh, pictures. Pictures. Uh, yeah, because um, this, th yeah, this, well, this, this actually, uh, Dan relates to this whole idea of uh, Lincoln's, uh, uh, I, I try to demonstrate that Lincoln uh, takes, in my opinion, risks uh, in certain respects with certain Jews uh, that help him to win their affinity one of which is a famous story having to do with a photograph that Lincoln allows is is he goes and lets up something. So I wondered, is there did these did these campaign biographies contain pictures, and how important were the pictures? Because this relates to my theories about right. this. In other words, I'd like to know how critically important the actual photograph of these candidates were, particularly Lincoln, to their success in the in the campaign. Well, imagine, uh, and you folks out there and out there, imagine voting today for a candidate and you have no idea what this person looks like. It, it almost seems unbelievable that that would happen. So campaign biographies in Lincoln's time, uh, as well as sheet music or broadsides or other genres of print, um, having an image of Lincoln was very important because you got the chance to see and any other candidate, you got a chance to see what they look like. Um, you know, the only chance of getting to see what a candidate looked like was to attend a campaign speech or rally or whatever. Newspapers uh, in 1860, uh, there were, outside of the illustrated newspapers, did not have the ability to produce images made from photographs. That yeah, was photography something. was really beyond That's the newspaper right. at this point. You could buy ah. a carte de visite, you know, if you for could afford time. If, For the first time, if you right. could afford one. But a lot of people uh, weren't near stores where they could buy one or didn't see a candidate. So the only chance they got to see what a candidate looked like was through print. And campaign biographies, virtually all of them, had either on the paper wrappers an image of Lincoln or other candidates or a frontispiece. And many of them were engravings or woodcuts that were based on the actual photograph. They didn't include the actual photograph. Uh, outside of that image of the candidate, uh, campaign biographies seldom had other illustrations. They might have an engraving of the log cabin, for example, that Lincoln was born in. 
But outside of that, they they seldom had other illustrations. It's interesting. I I, uh, I so so w- 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 would would a campaigner like Lincoln or others in that era? My 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 question is, w- wouldn't they be concerned about these pictures that were taken of them and want to make sure that these pictures made them the best they could be in in light of the fact that they could be used? I mean. Uh, do, do we have any evidence of that? Well, Lincoln, you know, certainly was very much in tune with technology and how photography would help him. Yeah. The, but just to quickly, I want you to answer, but just to say, my father used to say, I had hundreds of photographs taken of me. I've yet to see one that does me justice. <laughs> so Lincoln may have said the same <laughs> thing. Yes, yeah. But go well, ahead. Well, um, yes, you're right about Lincoln. Um, was one of the most photographed candidates <laughs> in the 19th century. And, you know, you initiated the photograph in many cases. I mean, no one forced Lincoln to go into, you know, a photographer shop to have his picture taken. Um, the iconic picture that uh, you know some historians and even Lincoln himself, I think, alluded to this that helped him in the 1860 campaign was the Cooper Union. Yeah. Photograph. That this photograph is, made me present. That's right. Uh, I don't know if he actually. Said I don't that, know either, but, but I like the you story. Know, Harold, <laughs> you know, but, Just like Sandberg. Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> but um, that photograph was the basis for many of the images you saw of Lincoln during the 1860 campaign. Um, there were other photographs. There was one of uh, other uh, photograph, famous photograph that was taken, I believe, in. 1858 of Lincoln it looked like he had put his hands through his hair, and his hair is just sticking up like this. The tousled hair. Front. Right. And, you know, I think Lincoln remarked, you know, that looks more like me than some of these other photographs. <laughs> well, that's uh, the one I just showed. The, that was the man. But many of these commercial firms that produced these campaign biographers were from the East. And a photograph such as the one I just referred to, they wanted Lincoln to look more dignified than maybe he really looked. Uh, so they they all fell back on the Cooper Union photograph, which made him look like or a Hessler. They, they or Hessler. Or Hessler, Hessler back right. down to take right. photographs of right. him in Springfield. That's right. So yeah. the same thing. Right. Uh, here are a couple of questions that came from the internet. And, um, uh, this is from Angela in Germany. We thank you for watching and for uh, sharing. Uh, <laughs> hi. I have a following up question for Mr. Horrocks concerning the interest of commercial companies producing campaign biographies on Lincoln. Did the number, excuse me, did the number grow or lessen from the 60 to 64 campaign in total? Uh, it lessened. And um, I believe... Thank it, you, Angela. Uh, thank you, Angela. Uh, good question. Uh, they lessened, and I believe the fact was that commercial firms weren't as interested in Lincoln as they were in 1864. 1864, Lincoln was a new commodity, a new face, uh, with this wonderful image of, you know, Honest Abe, the rail splitter. In 1864, you had two known candidates, McClellan and Lincoln. And the Lincoln story was sort of, in some ways, an old story. Um, and, you know, so I, I don't think there was that enthusiasm on the part of the commercial firms that there was in 1860. 1860. You know, I have, this is just my own personal feeling on this. I have no, nothing that, that I can document this. Uh, but I think that was the case, is that uh, it was a completely different environment in 1864 than it was in 1860. Well, Gary, uh Angela in Germany is on one side, Yes. but here on the other side, Damien in Hawaii, we appreciate you watching as well. I read more, I read more Jews lived in New York, Vicksburg, and Charleston than anywhere else in the U.S., true? Not exactly. Uh, New York, Vicksburg, uh, Yeah, the, the, uh, the, there is, the, the, the one thing I love to say is that from about 18, uh, 1805 to 1820, about, about then, Charleston, South Carolina, was the largest Jewish community in the United States, and that is true. Uh, but the evil empire uh, of New York, they, they've, they've, held, they've held that uh, uh, claim of, uh, of uh, being the largest Jewish community pretty much the rest of the American Jewish, uh, during American Jewish history. But I will say this, uh, 
My hometown currently, Cincinnati, Ohio, was for many, many years the second largest Jewish community uh, mm. through uh, about to the 18, late, mid-1860s, 1870s. So during President Lincoln's uh, uh, administration, it was a very important Jewish community.